Hey yo, what's good with everybody, man? I hope everybody's having a productive day, feeling blessed, and like I always say, it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. Well, man, I was gonna do this video, which I'm still gonna do the video, but in essence, though, something came up like maybe two hours ago, so I'll throw it in there in the beginning and then continue with the video. But trip out on this story, man. It's an crazy story. I'm about, I'm about to clown a little bit. I'm about to make fun of it a little bit. But still, the overall dynamics of the criminal activity and how they went about it, how they operated, is mind-blowing. So let's get into the video. With that being said, hit that subscribe button, hit that like, always leave a comment. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section. Check the links in the description for my Apple and Spotify music. Go ahead and run my streams up. And you can check out my playlist section on my YouTube channel and check out my music right there. Thank you guys for you guys' time. Most importantly, thank you guys for you guys' support. But in this video right here, we got two Riverside County brothers. Should I say brothers? Now, it doesn't say if they were affiliated with the Sureño faction, whether or not they were working for the Mexican mafia, but I can honestly tell you they were getting the supply from across that border. So we had Julio Martinez, AKA Primo. He was from Riverside. Then he had his brother named Victor Martinez, AKA Hector. He was from Hemet. Both these individuals got busted running a drug operation in Riverside County. And they got sentenced to 288 months in federal prison, admitting to a conspiracy to distribute, amongst other things. Here's the funny part. So what they did was they established an operation. First and foremost, they were getting all the dope from Mexico by carriers. Individuals that were concealing it while they were crossing the border or coming back from the border. You know, went out there, went to party on Rosalito, or they went to Hong Kong, or they went to go get some hook up with some muñecas and go party in Cancun and then came back. Some of these individuals even been identified that they were putting it in their body cavities. So they were putting it up their Duke shoot or they were swallowing balloons like what you would see, you know, on Narcos Mexico and all that. Since 2003 up until 2021, they got busted. In 2023, they finally got sentenced. Look at the time difference from 2003 up until 2021. And what made the investigation go crazy and sparked it and went out of control that really made law enforcement officers really crack down. You see, they went this long selling all this dope with the, in, in the way they did it. But it was that first time that somebody made a purchase and overdosed off this newfound, you know, Fetty that's being cut and produced and left in all the drugs. That's what made them say, you know what, it's time to crack them down. So they managed to go this long and this far. But the one time somebody passed away from using their dope, this was the time to crack it down. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. At least that's what the article stipulated. So what these individuals did is they established call centers. Yeah. Hotlines, party lines. Like back in the day, party lines, when you used to call the hyenas and you'd, you'd be in a group of like eight dudes and you'd be like, just one hyena and everybody's trying to flirt and shoot their shot and whoever you should hook up with, you know what I mean? That's, you, you won, you're the winner, but you're the player of the year. So they created these call centers in different stash houses, wherever they, wherever the location was at, whatever territory they were taking over, whatever territory that was permitted to them by the Mexican mafia to sell dope in this, in this particular region. So we got like maybe five or six call centers and you have an operator assigned to this phone that has to sit there on this house line, this landline that they pr provided for this house, and they answer the phone call, hello? And they were using coded messages, mind you, coded messages. And what you, what you would say is, like say if you wanted some black, you know, some, you know, some tar, you know, they would, that the code word for that was food. So you call the girl or call the secretary and she'd be like, hello, hello, and you'd be like, hey man, I need to buy some food, can I get some food? Yeah, sure, man. We were available, man. We're, we're, we're stocked right now, man. What do you need? A gram, the code word for gram was taco. So you're basically saying, hey, man, can I get some food? Yeah, man. How much? What, what, what are you looking for? What do you want? Man, can I get like three tacos? Might as well throw in some beans and nombales, arroz, and let me get a uh, orchata while you're at it. And that's what each call center did. Each call center had a specific coded phrases and coded messages when you wanted to get either black or you wanted to get meth, or you wanted to get whatever it is that you wanted to get, you had to know the phrases in advance, and you call these people, you place an order, 
Then you, then the person of, I think it was a uh, primo. He's right there, just overseeing all these calls. All right, man, that's what he wants. That's what he wants. We'll get it ready. Package it up. Yeah, go ahead and put it in a brown paper bag. Make sure the grease don't seep out the bag, bro. We're going to lose customers like that. And then he would get runners. Runners would go take it to him and then exchange money over for the dope. And then they may bring the money back and the money was getting placed into different banking accounts. So when I read this story, I'm like, you serious? The first thing that came to mind, bro, and let me see how old you guys really are, bro. Because this was like one of my favorite movies when I was young. I used to think like, man, I wish I, I'm going to be a pizza man one day, bro. I'm going I'm to knock all the cougars in my neighborhood. Lover boy. Remember when they had you order the pizza? And yeah, if you said extra anchovies, you came through and you got to hook up with all these women in the neighborhood. All these older ladies that you were either widows or going through a bad marriage or were lonely as hell. Extra, I'll never forget that movie, Extra Anchovies. If you ain't seen that movie, bro, you ain't living life right now, bro. Maybe you guys haven't, man. It's an old movie, bro. I don't think you guys, I think you guys are still too young for that. But, but that's pretty much what they did. They, they solidified a neighborhood DoorDash, but for dope. I hope they weren't charging for the same fee that DoorDash charges when you have to order food and then plus this at like ten, fifteen dollars for the travel expenses. Don't tell me you had to be like, all right, man, is this gram, these two grams right here, that's, you know, we'll, we'll give you two for 60, but I'm going to throw in an additional $20, man, because that's gas money, bro, so you got to pay 80 for this, man. Oh, you live in another city? Man, that's an extra hundo right there, bro, man. Gas prices is crazy, bro. I got to, if you want me to get there, I got to, you fill up my tank. That's pretty much what they were doing, was these call centers where you can purchase the dope, make a phone call, door dash it. You ain't got to go nowhere no more. All these car all these runners had their own vehicles provided by these drug lords. And that's what they would do all day is accept these phone calls, send the runners to go drop off the dope, bring the money back. And then they started deciding specific women to open up bank accounts in different uh, in different uh you know banks. None of the bank accounts exceeded over nine grand. Once the money was like right there, nine grand total. The money was getting released from the bank, sent off to different banks and different overseas accounts that made it back to Mexico. Once the bank account was empty, then they'll go throw one in another 9000 And that's how they were doing it for a very long time. Purchasing the dope with the money, sending it through wired accounts, refilling up the bank account, sending the wired accounts back over there. And they managed to do that from 2003 up into 2021. But that's what it took, though, was one individual. Now I'm thinking about that movie, Lover, but I'm going to have to watch it again just to trip out on that. I just watched that movie, Showgirls, again, man. I was like, man, I remember that movie when I was young. I was being a little pervert to that movie. But still, anyways, it finally took, you know, law enforcement to crack down on these individuals when, it's, when one individual died from an overdose. Most law enforcement conduct year, four or five year investigations because most of these investigations, they want to find the big players. They want to know where it's all going. They want to know where it's all coming from. So a lot of times they allow things that take place within the United States, within, you know, the specific regions they're investigating and the certain criminal activities and criminals that they're investigating at that point. But I don't know. But they always look at them like, oh, man, this is small time, man. We can bust him, threaten him. He'll turn on this pool. We'll let release him or we'll keep him as a confidential foreman. We'll pay him. But we want the bigger guys. We want the bigger guys. So they always let things slide or sweep it under the rug or don't hold them accountable for it. Because they want to go after the big fish, but it in this case, one individual dies and they felt like they had to, they felt the need to really intervene now and say, you know what, we're done with this, man. It's time to crack these individuals down. Let them go for almost 20 years. Doing this for almost 20 years. But one person passes away over an overdose and they finally said, you know what, enough is enough. So these individuals got sentenced to 288 months in federal penal system. So they still have a date. The police reports and the articles doesn't indicate that, you know, there's the investigations crossing that border and they're going to go over there and figure out who these individuals are really working for. So they're looking at these individuals as the sole, you know, kingpins of this organization and they busted them. But trip out on that, right? They door dash dope. Now, why can't you apply that same intelligent, smart work ethics and just create an Amazon shoplifting website or uh, drop shifting website or you could have did something entirely different if you were that smart, not capable and think to say, you know what, instead of being on these street corners, instead of driving around in this vehicle, burning up gas, you know what, I'm just going to establish a landline and they can call me whenever they want. And then if they want, and then I'll just send homeboy on a bike. I'll buy a couple of these junctures, some beach cruisers. I might even get him a diamond back with pegs. 
then just send a little homies to go do it, drop it off, bring my money back, and everything's cool, and I ain't got to leave my couch, the safety of my home. That's how they were able to do it. So I wanted to bring that story to you guys' attention, and also the movie Lover Boy, because that's what it reminded me of. Can I get some extra anchovies? Anchovies? All right. You want some anchovies? Okay. You know, let's just get it in. So with that being said, like I always say, it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. Peace.